excitement of what was going to happen. Uh, we were encouraged to bid on the building next door to the garlic press so that we could open uh, a food operation to go along with our kitchen store. Uh, the, uh, I very vividly remember coming to the council meeting with Larry Mashoff for the Bank of Illinois and me for the garlic press asking for a little bit of help with the, our new projects. And uh, we were the first people, I think, to step forward and say, we'd like to be part of that new, the new uptown. Well, in 2005, the cafe finally opened after much work. In 2008, the College Avenue deck opened. And in 2009, the Digachines, my grandson's term for construction machines, the Digachines were on North Street again. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> I think we can go. That's mm -hmm. that's what a great recap of that of that 22 years. Thanks, Dottie. <laughs> Wayne Aldrich uh, has been with the town for 16 years. Originally employed as a city engineer from 2002 to 2013, he served as uptown development director, where he was in charge of a extensive renewal of the Central Business District, obviously. Uh, November 2013, he was appointed Public Works Director. Previously was employed by the Illinois Department of Transportation District 3 in Ottawa for 14 years. Has experience in all phases of project development and implementation. Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from U of I, a registered professional engineer in Illinois. We're happy to have on the panel Wayne Aldrich. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here and very honored to be on this panel today. I've uh, been a part of this community really uh, since my employment with IDOT began in 1984. I know that's going back a ways, but uh, um, I really wanted to bring up a few projects that kind of speak to the growth of Bloomington Normal uh, that I was involved with back then. Uh, and, and just a word about IDOT. IDOT in District 3, which was where I was from, always paid attention to Bloomington Normal because of the amount of growth happening. So, so that's something that everybody looks to Bloomington Normal because of the activity uh, in this community. But um, some of the projects that I was involved in really before 1993 uh, at IDOT, primarily in construction, and you'll be familiar with these, is the US 51 expansion south of Bloomington going to, from a two-lane road to a four-lane road. Diamond Star Parkway, uh, which is old, was old 150 replacement for the Diamond Star plant at that time, now uh, Mitsubishi. Uh, very large project uh, initiative uh, at that time. Interstate 39 got built at that time, so I was involved in construction of Interstate 39. We all recall, like many of us may recall, old 51 and how uh, bad that was. So that was a huge improvement that really opened up uh, uh, Bloomington Normal to the north. And then uh, also was involved with the construction of the I-55, I-74 interchange just northwest of Normal here. And then uh, really during this period that we're talking about, 1993, uh, was involved with IDOT as a project design engineer for the expansion of Veterans Parkway uh, in Bloomington Normal and the expansion of I-55-74 around town. So again, a lot of major infrastructure projects uh, at the IDOT level around Bloomington Normal. When I left uh, uh, IDOT, I remember the district engineer at the time saying, why, why normal? Why do you want to leave us and go to normal? Uh, you know, expecting that, that uh, you know, a smaller town, things like that, and there's not going to be as much activity. And I told him, I think there's a lot of uh, progressive thought in normal, and I, there's a lot of growth, and I think there's going to be a lot of engineering activity for me here in normal. And I will say that that's certainly been the case throughout my career uh, in normal. Um, again, uh, in normal, focused on primarily infrastructure projects, the development and implementation of uh, infrastructure. Um, and, and some of those projects uh, during this period, uh, I think uh, Wiley Drive was one, the expansion of Tawanda Avenue uh, and the Tawanda Avenue Bridge, uh, a ton of subdivision work and commercial development during this period. That's what I recall is just a lot of subdivisions being built everywhere 
and the town having to react to that by building arterial streets, inspecting subdivisions, uh, adding sewers, things like that. Um, unit 5 expansion that, that Alan will talk about a little bit later. Uh, Heartland College was built out on West Rab Road, so that was a big uh, initiative, and the town responded with uh, sewers and, and West Rab. We constructed West Rab Road at that time. Uh, some projects that you don't think about, sewer projects, a major expansion of the Firestone Sanitary Sewer. Uh, bridges and culverts. Uh, when I came to the town, I think there were like three bridges that were posted or closed at the time. We even had to close the Camelback Bridge for a while. Uh, and I, I can report today, I mean, we, we constantly have had a program to replace bridges, and right now we're in great shape as far as our, our bridge infrastructure. And then I did mention the Camelback Bridge. I, I played a role in that. Um, that was an interesting project, uh, but uh, I think everybody's happy with that. What's kind of funny about that project it, from my perspective is I know that the community talked about that project for a long, long time, and there's a lot of debate about that, but... I think once we got it done, everybody's very happy with it, and you never hear a word uh, about it anymore. But I, I, I think the community is, is very happy with the, the way the Camelback Bridge turned out. Uh, and then in 2002, became a part of the Uptown Project, and I won't say much about that. Dottie covered a lot of that, and I'm sure there's going to be more discussion about the Uptown Project, but a very uh, fulfilling uh, professional experience for me. I would say 30% of that project was engineering and I was familiar with it, but the other 70% was, was a new experience for me and, and, and a good experience, I would say. Um, and I also during this period, uh, you know, Normal's really gained a reputation for progressive thinking and action. I mean, it's just not just laying a plan out, it's, it's acting on that plan. So I think that's a hallmark of, of what's happened in Normal over these years. Uh, and just, just finally, just been an exciting time uh, to be a staff member at the Town of Normal and very proud to be part of the Normal staff during this period. Thank you. I recently ran across the, the, uh, a story in the pantograph about, the, about a town council meeting in 1955 that they were addressing a proposal about taking the hump out of the yeah. camel brack <laughs> So he, when he says it's a long time, that's, that's, that's 60 years. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's still got the hump in it. Yeah. Retired Unit 5 Superintendent Alan Chapman grew up in Normal, attended U of I, uh, BA in the teaching of social studies, 1969. He earned a master's in education and a doctor of education degree, both from Illinois State University. He began his professional career in Unit 5 at Chittix, teaching 7th and 8th grade social studies. It's on. Should be. Uh, after that school year, he went to the Army, served two years. Turned in 1972, Chapman was uh, assigned to teach U.S. and world history, coach varsity tennis at NCHS. He became dean of students there in 1973, assistant principal at Chittix in 1982, then Parkside Junior High as principal in 88, uh, principal of NCHS in 1990, until he retired in 2002. In January 2004, he uh, returned as interim superintendent of Unit 5 and after six months was appointed superintendent, led that school district until he retired in 2007. In 2008, he served as United Way of McLean County Annual Campaign Chair and uh, from October of 13 through April of last year, served as interim president and CEO of the United Way. He's been inducted into the ISU College of Education Alumni Hall of Fame received the Berkner's Mercier Alumni Service Award by the uh, Alumni Association. Uh, he and his wife Kathy, also by the way, a graduate of NCHS and ISU, uh, live in Normal. She taught third grade at Hoos in Normal prior to her retirement in 2005. They're proud of three adult children and grandparents of six grandchildren. I just wanted to give you the breadth of this <laughs> gentleman I have. Such affection for Alan Chapman. <clears throat>
Thank you, Dan. Um, it, it's been a blessing for me to be in this community for so long. And uh, I counted up the years. Uh, when I left the superintendency in 2007, I had been a part of Unit 5 uh, either as a student or as a, a staff member for 46 of the first 59 years of, this, of the district's existence. So I feel like I, I've got a, a sufficient background perhaps to share a little bit with you about Unit 5 today. As most of you know, Unit 5 serves not only the town of Normal, but significant parts of the city of Bloomington, virtually all of the perimeter, um, except for the, the near north side of Bloomington, um, and the surrounding communities of Carlock, Hudson, and Tawanda, and a total of about 200 square miles of, of uh, the middle of McLean County. Uh, the themes that characterize Unit 5 during this time period that we're talking about uh, include growth, and that's a continuation of the growth that started when Unit 5 was formed in 1948. It's been a steady and continuous growth that has closely mirrored the growth not only in the town of Normal and the city of Bloomington, but, but in McLean County. Uh, we, uh, we had, we, we went over 9,000 students in 1996 and are currently in the middle 13,000 today. And the growth has been quite uh, constant, not always at the same rate, but quite constant. Um, another theme is uh, managing finances uh, in a way that we can provide quality programs and opportunities for success for students and still stay within the, uh, the boundaries of the budgets that we were able to produce um, given the, uh, the complexities of state aid from the state of Illinois, um, which was, was always an issue. Um, we have benefited by uh, steady, steadily increasing uh, property values in our district, which produced additional tax revenue each year. But it was always a challenge to, um, to create uh, and maintain a budget that uh, l allowed us to live within our means. And I think we've been quite successful in doing that over the years. Uh, underlying all of that was our constant effort to um, provide a, a, a broad-based curriculum that provided the, the maximum opportunities for students to be successful uh, in, uh, in the classroom in school activities, in athletics, and all the aspects of, of schooling that uh, is a part of public education. And I think uh, we have, um, over the years, been able to attract uh, high quality teachers and staff members, and uh, I think have been recognized as, uh, as having done a, a pretty good job uh, with providing education for students in our community. Finally, uh, normal mayor Chris Coos elected to his first term on the town council in April of 2001. Sworn in as mayor of the town of Normal, February 2003. His current term runs until 2017, and that makes Mayor Coos the longest-serving mayor in the history of the town of Normal. Bloomington Normal native, attended Central Catholic High School, ISU. He's been a Sony. Was there a problem with that? Is that wrong? No, I'm just amazed. Oh, you're just amazed. <laughs> he looks so young. <laughs> <laughs> He's been owner and operator of Vitesse Cycle and off and running now retail specialty stores in up the uptown since 1979. Long been active in the community, civic activities, including Chairmanship of the Town of Normal Historic Preservation Commission for eight years. Member of the Uptown Normal Business Association, served four years as president of that organization. During the restoration of the Normal Theater, Mr. Coos served as a chair of the Restoration Advisory Committee, went on to serve on the Normal Theater Advisory Board. Served as vice chair of the Selective Service Board of Appeals since 1983. And during his tenure on the town council, Chris also represented the town on the Bloomington Normal Area Convention and Visitors Bureau Committee 
the Economic Development Council and the Illinois Municipal League. We're lucky to have as our mayor, Chris Coos. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'll start off by saying that uh, I'm not the historian my brother is, so sometimes my dates are off and, and that, but I'll try and do the best I can. And I also uh, have three fact checkers in the room, Sonia Reese and Paul Harmon and uh, Randy Wood, so I've got to be extra careful here on my comments, I think. Um, in 1991, uh, my business was just the test cycle shop, and we were located in the south half of the building that is Pub 2, and had been there from the start. And the, um, it was, a, it was a, a good location for us, I'm surprised, um, because we had no parking. And when I say we had no parking, I mean we had no parking. There was no street parking. Uh, all the parking around, was, uh, around us was uh, private. And to this day, I still don't know how we did as well as we did in that location. In 1992, I'd bought out my uh, existing partners in the business. Um, they went on to pursue different things and um, about two weeks after we signed the documents the first Gulf War happened and if you will recall during that time um, that was the beginning of, of cable news network and uh, CNN had the primarily had the uh, the upper leg on that and people were watching TV 24 hours a day almost following the Gulf War it was a, it was a new type of journalism but it also was something that killed my business. I mean, it killed my business. And I don't know if you had the same effect or not, but um, people were, were not shopping. They were watching TV and they were watching the Gulf War. It was kind of an interesting time at that time. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, when I was president of the Downtown Business Association, but um, it was in the, in the early 90s and we, uh, I think Randy probably talked, Randy Wood probably talked about this the last time. Um, it was an interesting business environment being in, in downtown Normal at that time because there were key businesses that, that really carried the water. There was the garlic press, there was uh, solid gold jewelers, jewelers um, uh, music shop, my shop, uh, a couple of others that were kind of the mainstream businesses in, that, in, 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 the, uptown, or in the downtown area at that time. And a lot of the other businesses were just kind of revolving door. They'd come for a couple of years and they'd leave, and, and there really wasn't a lot of stability there. And our biggest challenge at that time was trying to get people to come to downtown normal. And it was, it was difficult, and that was kind of our marketing efforts uh, from the Downtown Normal Business Association, because we had this situation where people thought that um, they couldn't come to downtown normal because it was full of students. And the truth was, the students didn't come to downtown normal. So it was a, it was a constant battle to, to work through that. Um, historic preservation had become uh, an important uh, uh, element in the community at that time. Uh, I, I came on uh, the commission in the early 90s, uh, replacing Dr. Robert Bone, who'd passed away, and, and I took his position on that. and. Um, you mentioned the Camelback Bridge earlier. Uh, uh, we always used to say on the Historic Preservation Commission that the argument about whether to save the bridge or not was equally as historic as whether uh, the bridge itself. Uh, there was so much back and forth on that bridge for years and years and years. Uh, we established some historic preservation community, uh, districts in the community. Uh, Cedar Crest was the first uh, um, historic preservation district. And that was a um, um, divisive uh, conversation in the community. It was very difficult for the community. Um, there were a lot of people who thought it was a bad idea. There were a lot of people that thought it was a great idea. Um, and I think there are probably people that still feel that way about historic preservation. Uh, we established a number of landmarks, one which, of course, was the normal theater. Um, the town acquired that property um, because um, there was concern that uh, uh, 
about the only thing that it was going to be it was some type of sports bar. That was the only thing they had um, planned for that. So we felt like um, that was something worth saving. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over this a little bit because I'm going to run out of time here. Uh, in the beginnings of Uptown, uh, I should say in 1995, we moved our business to our current location and started off and running. Uh, there was a running store in the community that was failing and by the time we got open, had gone out of business. Uh, I saw it as a unique opportunity to expand my business and we did that in 1995. About 1999, I was asked to serve on a committee that um, was going through a selection process for Uptown. Um, the, the council at that time had decided um, that something needed to be done in the downtown district and um, so um, they had decided to proceed with hiring a consulting group to do that and uh, I was honored to serve on that group to, to pick uh, the consulting group that went ahead and, and developed the very successful uptown plan. The two first major projects I think of note uh, in the Uptown area or the Children's Discovery Museum. That was a project that the town undertook. Uh, we did public and private fundraising uh, on that project. And, and the desire of the council at that time was to have a, a, a really spectacular structure and facility so that the Children's Discovery Museum could grow in scope in terms of its, the services it offered. But it was also strategic on the council's part because we wanted to have a, a, a building in the uptown area that was kind of iconic for what we expected the uptown to become. It, it served as much as a public example to, to future businesses. Um, the other project I think of important was the Bank of Illinois, now Heartland Bank, um, because that was the first private development in the new uptown area. And the, and the bank was very nervous about doing that development. They had purchased land out on East uh, Route 9 and we're going to close their facility here or drastically reduce its scope and, and build a new, uh, new bank building on, on the east side of Bloomington. Um, Mark Peterson and I had a couple of meetings with the bank and we uh, went, went over our plan very, very rigorously with them um, and con tried to convince them to, that actually that their future was in uptown normal, not out on the east side. And um, their board, went through that and they agreed and so they built that building. And it's a four-story building and, and Mark and I were, were, would tell Larry Mashoff, you're not building this building big enough. And he said, you know, you may be right, but it's, uh, it's the first private development and we're, we're kind of nervous about it, so we're going to be a little cautious. By the time the bank opened, he said, you're right, I should have put another floor on that for the, for the people who wanted to lease space in the building. He, he immediately leased it out in a big hurry. Other things that were happening in the community uh, during those, while Uptown was developing, people think that the, the focus was totally on Uptown um, in the early 2000s and that, but um, two major projects, the first would be the shops at College Hills. Uh, you all remember that College Hills was a failing mall, and, and uh, besides not building uptown, um, uh, probably the most asked question we had, or biggest comment, is what are you going to do about College Hills Mall? Um, the Cullen Development Group out of Peoria came forward on that project, um, and it was a difficult project, and I, and I know Wayne can attest to that. It was very, very tricky financially, it was very difficult. Uh, physically to build that, but we're very proud of the end result of that. Um, I think I'm going to cut cut off here because I've probably exceeded my time here, and we'll just. I'm sure you've got lots of questions, and I'll wait for those. Thank you. Great. <laughs> just just before we leave the, the the concept of the downtown, just a, a a a couple of other things before we leave downtown and talk about other things. Uh, We've got two, two business owners on the panel. Wayne, could you uh, talk about from, from your perspective and from engineering's perspective, how you undergo this massive infrastructure alteration, but at the same time preserve the ability of us to go to the Garwick Press and to the test cycle and off and running and, and, and do business there? 
Again, I think it was a lot of planning. Uh, uh, from an engineering standpoint, uh, we talked to other communities that have done this type of thing, maybe not on the scale that we did, but to uh, make sure that, uh, from an, again, from a physical or an engineering standpoint, that access is maintained. So we talked about different ways to do that, uh, and along with the businesses. I mean, we, we worked with the businesses at the time to get their opinions about things, knowing that things weren't going to be ideal for everyone during this period, but really, I, th I think another thing is to hopefully we told the truth. You know, here's here's the way it's going to be from our perspective. What do you think, and how can we help minimize your your grief during this this process? But uh, so maintaining access, providing parking areas. Uh, there was some areas that you may recall that we just turned into parking areas, temporary parking areas for the folks to park at before we uh, built the decks, and then. Uh, make sure sidewalks were accessible to folks, the businesses' front doors, which were restricted because we still had to build the road, but there's a lot of planning on how we did that. But uh, many uh, downtown areas, there's a, a rear door entrance, and the Garlic Press has one, which you actually uh, updated during that period, but uh, a lot of businesses did not, so we had to maintain that front door access. Uh, and, and other ways, you know, the council supported uh, businesses uh, through the budget process by providing grant programs, the facade grant program where uh, the town would invest in, in facades as much as 50% of the cost of the facades. And I know that's why you see most of the facades at this point in Uptown have been, been restored. Uh, there's also a program where uh, the town uh, invested in the business by helping write down uh, interest on a business loan of I think it was up to hundred thousand dollars for uh, a business loan the town helped write down I think it was three percent of that interest cost so so not not you know directly saying here's here's uh, the money I need you know to help my business the town did support these businesses in those those ways which I thought was very important the other thing we did was we hired staff I mean we had town staff uh, primarily uh, ran this project and managed this project. Um, we uh, hired a uh, uptown marketing manager at the time and, and their primary role was not just to market the uptown which uh, which was uh, but to be liaison with the property owners so if there was any issues with the property owners during that period they would talk to it was Nora Dukowitz and uh, you would call Nora up and say, Nora, I got a problem with this or that, you know, and she'd say, well, <laughs> well, let's deal with, here's how we're going to deal with that, or I, I better talk to Wayne or whatever. So, so I think those were investments that the town made, uh, all the help support uh, the uptown businesses. And, and again, marketing was a part of that too. I think we did help yep. uh, market the whole uptown uh, during that period. So those are some things that immediately come to my mind. Okay. Uh, Dottie, now le lean forward into the microphone. Uh, Alan's the educator, but give, give Wayne a grade. What, what kind of job did they, did they do for the businesses during that transitional period? <laughs> I'd say they, let's give you A minus. I mean, you could have brought the customers to our door, but you didn't do that. <laughs> but, I'll take that. Though. Okay. No, it, it was, the communication was wonderful. And, uh, we, I'm sure you got tired of us bugging you about everything, but you were always so good, and Nora was great, and you know, we used you uh, fully. I, it would have been very painful without that. What, what kind of feedback, even today, do you get from, from people about the, from your customers about the downtown, from visitors to the community? Oh, they love it. I mean, it's not everything about it, but the, uh, the visitors to the community are, are really just amazed at how nice it is and it's beautiful and we've got things going on. And I, I sort of had this sight feeling that, you know, ISU had more enrollment in this last year. And I think it's partly because as the families came to visit the university, they had this wonderful looking place. It used to just be kind of dumpy little things and, and it, it, it just, there's places to be and they're, I really think that's helped the university as well. And uh, you know, people are surprised sometimes when they come that they find there's some really nice, good things that we're not, you know, a bit up to date. And uh, the uh, customers, the local people are, they're even the ones that probably 
were worried about the roundabout. I remember that it was very, con mm -hmm. oh, that was going to be terrible. And, uh, but they're very, very surprised and happy with it. They, they st they're still, I'm still trying to train people to park in the parking deck. They are local people, <laughs> and, but we're working on it because, and it's, it's been very, you know, it's really good to have it there. So I'd, I'd say it's a, an ama it's just an amazing transformation. Great. Thank you. Mayor, I, you hinted at this, but I'd like you to just expand on it just a, a little, a little bit. Uh, we really today think of, of the uptown almost as the, the, the trademark it's a, the, uh, of the town. It, it really, I don't think, was always thus, and there was a, there was a, a, a conscious effort to, to, to bring a focus on, on the uptown area, or the, even the downtown area. Am I, am I right in that? Well, it was, uh, it was part of the um, overall marketing incent or efforts that we made to uh, reinforce what we were doing because um, for years um, there were people that lived in this community that never set foot in downtown, in downtown normal. Right. Uh, anecdotally, uh, I was at a, a trade show and there was a, a, a guy I met at the show that had three bike shops in uh, Southern California and had gone to ISU and had never set foot in my store because he, he never went to downtown Bloomington. So we had this monumental uh, task of getting people to, to start coming down there. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't come because of the construction, but on the other hand, a lot of people c came because of the construction to see, see what was happening. <coughs> and uh, downtown became uptown as, as part of a marketing strategy. Uh, we felt that, um, when was that? I know it's oh, much longer ago than I think it was. Probably 2005, something like oh, that's that. That's unbelievable. <clears throat> Maybe a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, and, and the thinking was, you know, you've got downtown Bloomington. Uh, we could cross market by being uptown normal. We were to the north. They were to the south. Um, we just felt that uh, by, by making the name distinctly different, you know, downtown Bloomington, downtown normal, that, that we could market um, the uptown much better. And it, it's proven to be the case. I think th the other thing I'd, I'd like to point out about this is uh, people that came to school here and hadn't been here in 10 or 15 years, when they come back, the wow factor is just off the charts for them. You know, and those of us who, who kind of went through it day by day, uh, you know, we didn't see the dramatic change. I, obviously, you did when looking back, but you didn't, you didn't have that impact of, of coming back to it and going, oh my God, what happened here? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I think the success of Uptown is much better known outside the community than it is inside the community. Um, we were used as a model by uh, um, you know, U.S. Department of Transportation in terms of how to build uh, uh, communities centered around transportation assets. Uh, we've won two national awards for the Uptown. Uh, I get speaking invitations all over the country to talk about what we did and how we did it. Thanks. Now, before we throw it open to the to the audience, uh, uh, Alan, you're not off the hook here. We, we've got to talk about Unit 5, and uh, you were, whether you like it or not, liked it or not, the steward of tremendous growth in the school district, uh, tremendous growth in enrollment, the necessity for new facilities. Could you t talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, I alluded earlier to the fact that Unit 5 started in, in 1948 and has grown continuously since then. Uh, to bring it into the period of time that we're talking about, uh, during the five years from 1996 to 2000 and from from uh, 2000 to 2005, we grew at a rate of just less than 3% each year. The five years from, two from 2000 to 2005, we grew at a little more than 2%. And then interestingly, for the last five years, our growth has drastically slowed and we're almost at a level point uh, during the last five years. In fact, the, uh, the peak enrollment year for us was uh, 2012. So we're very close to that today, but, but the growth has really uh, significantly changed over that, uh, 
over the period of time that we're discussing today. During the 17 years from 1994 to 2011, we built and opened nine new schools in our community uh, and renovated the old Normal Community High School and created Kingsley Junior High School at the same time. So essentially 10 new buildings, only five of which are actually in Normal. Uh, the others are in Bloomington. Um, but um, that's, that's been our response to the growth. Uh, interestingly, in, in 1995, after 47 years of uh, having only one high school in Unit 5, we opened Normal Community West High School. Um, there was a lot of concern as we were planning for that uh, school to be built and opened that we were uh, going to diminish the quality of our high school education in the community. Uh, we would uh, dilute the talent pool in academics and in activities and athletics. Um, history, I think, has shown that uh, what we did was <coughs> virtually doubled all the opportunities for students and both schools continued to be successful uh, almost immediately. Uh, West got off to a great start. Normal community continued to be successful. And um, I don't think anyone today would look back at that and say that was a negative for us. Uh, it's been a, been a really good move. So th those are some of the responses to growth. Uh, during the period roughly from 2005 to 2009, we were also able to uh, use geothermal technology to provide air conditioning mm. for all of the schools, all of the older buildings in our district that were not air conditioned as part of the original construction. Uh, and that was a, a huge development also that provided uh, uh, more than a little bit of comfort for staff and students when, uh, when we get some really hot days, both in the fall and the spring. So it, it's, been a, it's been an interesting uh, challenge to, uh, to deal with growth, to uh, provide facilities that were adequate to serve the number of students that we've had, but we've got a, a high quality uh, collection of buildings and, and uh, right now are, are well suited to, uh, to serve the students that we have. I, it, it, I'm, I'm reminded because I live, live out that way and on the way to work every morning I, I see normal community high school. Uh, Wayne, normal community high school is actually closer I think to downtown Tawanda than it is to uptown normal. What, it, that must, must have presented challenges to take care of, of, of a, a new facility, you know, northeast out in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, at the time, uh, Unit 5 came to us, you know, with their plans to construct the, both Grove and uh, normal community out there. And at the time, really the only thing that was out there, I think Eastview Christian Church was out there, roads were not improved. There weren't uh, any sort of water lines ran out there or uh, public sewers, sanitary sewers. And so I think uh, this, we had to react quickly because I, I think you wanted to get the schools open quickly. Uh, and the council supported that. So the council, um, Sonia's here, she can recall some things, correct me if I, I misspeak, but uh, um, the council wanted to support the growth of Unit 5 in that area and uh, we had to react very quickly uh, to build the roads. Airport Road needed to be built um, from north of Fort Jesse up to Rab Road. Rab Road partially reconstructed uh, to a two-lane road. Uh, water infrastructure had to be built up there. We have a new water tower up there as part of that. Uh, and as well as sanitary sewer, considerable amount of sanitary sewer, uh, including the airport road lift station, which we actually had a plan for future development when we developed the sanitary sewer system also because the airport road uh, sanitary sewer system is built to uh, for additional growth in that north uh, east area so considerable uh, expenditure i'm th i don't know the exact number but i think about eight to ten uh, million dollars of uh, town investment and at the time we did not do any bond issue to to pay for that so financing of that project was another issue and uh, because we have a, had a great uh, finance staff and worked with the administration, I, I believe just with reserves and other things, uh, the town came up with funding for that infrastructure project. 
Uh, so at the time, that, that was the biggest infrastructure project I believe the town had ever taken on until the uptown. So um, Alan Crick, I think uh, the time frame was probably two years, not, not much, but I think it was about two years. From the, from the bond issue to the, uh, yeah. to the completion? From the Unit 5 announcement before school opening. So About two and a half. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I think the really impressive part was the funding by the town. The town uh, did uh, find the funding for that and that uh, because it was town funding, there was no strings attached to the funding. And we were able to uh, complete those improvements on time for the school openings. So a, a very successful project in that regard. I think if there's a theme that comes shining through not only this week, but the, the panel that we had last week that most of you uh, attended. Uh, first of all, vision, but secondly, a can-do attitude that we are blessed to, to live in a, in a community that, that, that collectively kind of has that. I've uh, dominated the questioning, and we've got about a half an hour to go. Certainly there maybe is something right, right, right here, I think. Right, 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 right here. <clears throat> Hi, um, I can attest to the wow factor. My grown, three grown children um, no longer live here. They live up north in the suburbs and in the city of Chicago. But when they come back home and we go to Uptown Normal, that wow factor certainly exists with them. A couple of years ago, my six-year-old granddaughter <coughs> was visiting and uh, we went to Uptown Normal. I think we were on our way to the Children's Museum and we took a stroll through the transportation center and Ava said to me, she didn't know what it was. It was cold that day and I think we just wanted to walk through. And she said, wow, Mimi, this is a really nice airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one has talked about this facility, the transportation center. Are we going to today or has that already let's, been addressed? Let's do it right now. Okay. Mayor, you want to? jump off there? Um, I'll start by saying every major project and 75% of the minor projects were hard. They were very, very difficult. And um, the transportation center was probably at the top of the list because we, we'd had a plan and we knew we were going to need federal dollars um, to make that work. And frankly, we weren't getting them. Um, we'd go to Washington. We'd, we'd get, for years, we would get appropriations that effectively um, covered the inflation of construction costs every year. And so we were um, determined to get it built, but we just, we didn't know how. And we were, we were in Washington, we were at the state of Illinois um, constantly trying, trying to get the funding we needed for that. Um, when the uh, recession hit, um, the federal government did uh, um, a significant amount of funding uh, to stimulate about growth in business and construction in the United States. And part of that was a, a program called Tiger Grant, which was a competitive grant um, that was uh, uh, given to projects that were innovative in, in, in transportation, in the world of transportation. Um, there was $1 billion that was allocated to that um, Tiger Grant Fund nationally, and there were $50 billion worth of requests. But uh, because we indeed were ready, and, uh, and uh, the test was you needed to be shovel ready for the project, and um, there were a lot of different definitions of shovel ready floating around the, the, the country. People would say, well, our project's shovel ready. Well, have you done your environmental work on it yet? Well, we're getting to it. We're getting about ready to do it. Well. They weren't ready. But we had, in anticipation of, of getting funding, we had done all the, all the uh, uh, and Wayne can probably talk to that better, all the authorizations we needed from the federal government, all the studies we needed to complete, and we had construction plans. Uh, when we went through the design process of that, of that facility, uh, one of the caveats of that was um, th this project will likely go on the shelf. So you need to factor that into your design, and and they did. And so we, you know, I won't say we were lucky. I think um, we had a great project, and we were ready. 
I'd say too, yeah, the, we were prepared. Um, I think folks have called us lucky before, and I remember a conversation I had with a former Illinois Secretary of Transportation. He said, Wayne, you weren't lucky, you were ready to go. And I think uh, in the industry, we're respected for that, that because we were prepared, we understood what it took to get this type of project built and, and resulted in this uh, beautiful facility. Dottie, is there a, to the business operator, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, is there, is there a payoff, a bounce back to having this terrific building that we're in right now? Can you see it? Well, I mean, it is it, come, come, it, it come. is an amazing building, and uh, we get we get oh right. sorry we uh, we we get some business just practically people who because the trains are late come over and shop, <laughs> but uh, that's nice, and it's um, it's partly just part of the respect for what an amazing town of you can't this is not a dumpy little town when it has a building like this you know it's just so impressive, and uh, so people like that. One thing that I wish more of the community could could enjoy is touring this on a weekend sometime. I mean, it's it's like an art gallery. It's beautiful. The views are beautiful, but a lot of the town never sees it from up, you know, in this part of the building. Yeah. And I kind of wish they could. To to expand on that, um, we took uh, a portion of the uh, proceeds. Um, <coughs> that we got for Tiger Grant and allocated it to art. And there are <clears throat> 82 pieces of art in the building, all done by McLean County artists. And it is impressive. Great question, thank you. We're gonna come over here and then back to you. Uh, my question relates to uh, one of the words you used about sustainability. Um, and that would relate to economies of scale. Um, how do you all think in terms of sustainability of having duplicate systems in this area? Two school systems, two libraries, mm -hmm. two police, two all these public services because I think the one thing that's not sustainable is to continue to raise taxes and when we have particularly administrative overhead costs that are duplicated in large, how, how do you approach those kinds of things from your perspectives of sustainability? It's a very good question. And I think, uh, first off, I would say when you say two school systems and two fire departments and two police departments, um, the, the savings by combining them is really not that great because you, you still need the same number of police officers, the same number of, of, of firemen, the same number of school teachers, and the same number of facilities to support the community. You know, and, and that's, that's been talk of, um, you know, there's been two attempts to combine the two cities into, into one unit of government. Uh, both, both have failed in a referendum in the community. Um, we try as much as possible to, to gain efficiencies uh, with cooperation with uh, the City of Bloomington Unit 5. Um, we have a very robust uh, use of Unit 5 facilities for, for parks and recreation programs, for after school programs that we run for, for kids, um, and Unit 5 uses our facilities. Um, so there, there is a sharing there. We always look for those economies of scale and those opp opportunities to cooperate um, you know, I'd like to see more, but it, it's difficult sometimes. And, you know, to be candid, um, the two communities right now, Bloomington and Normal, are so very much different in their philosophies uh, that it would be very difficult right now to, to undertake something like that. From the education point of view, uh, both school districts are large and both are successful at this point. Uh, I've always said in response to that question that, that we really need to answer two questions in order to know whether we should advocate for a merger of the two school districts. One is, can we do it better um, as a merged district as opposed to how we're doing it independently at this point? And secondly, can we do it uh, less expensively? And it would take a, a pretty sophisticated study to, to answer those two questions. I don't know the answers to those two questions. We had a referendum in our community and as well uh, to, uh, to attempt a merger and, and that did not, 
did not pass at the time. Um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting we should or shouldn't. Uh, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, it would take some study to, to uh, determine that. Very, very good question. And over, there was a question here. Hi, I too would like to attest to the wow factor. I'm a, although I've lived in McLean County a long time, I'm a relatively new resident of normal Illinois. I have a brother or a sister and brother-in-law who lived most of their lives in, in New York City, recently moved back to Chicago. My sister comes down often and she always wants to come to Uptown Normal. When she is here from Chicago, she has her favorite shops and eating places here. Um, no, the other question is about the transportation center. Um, am I correct in assuming that the idea of this transportation hub was always a part of the uptown revitalization? And was there ever any contention with uh, downtown Bloomington wanting a traffic, the traffic center or the transportation hub? Um, it, it, it was always part of the plan. It, uh, early on um, in, a, in a charrette or a, a community planning process, we had the notion of bringing all, all the uh, nodes of transportation that we could under one roof because not only is this a train station, it serves regional buses, it serves the local bus system, uh, it's a right adjacent to Constitution Trail, um, it um, serves uh, shuttles to O'Hare and Midway airports. So that was the plan, is to bring all, the, all these modes of transportation under, under one roof. Um, I think the uh, opportunity uh, for Bloomington to do something like that, um, we probably had the jump start because we had the current Amtrak station. Um, the Am Amtrak station left, oh, left Bloomington, I don't know, Paul, was it early 90s? This one opened in 1990. Um, because, because of passenger rail at, at the time. And it's kind of interesting, if, if you look around the country, um, train stations are always uh, in the center of a community. They were always in the downtown, and Bloomington's never was. And that was, a, that was a, uh, an issue of topography. Downtown Bloomington sits on a hill, and the cost of, uh, of bringing a train into the uptown area um, was unsurmountable at that time. Well, and you so had the, that's, ra the rail yards and everything on the west side. Right, and, right. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but again, yes, it was always, uh, it was always part of uh, one of the key keystone projects in the uptown. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the um, environmental uh, things that went into the planning of all these buildings? Sure. Uh, th there are several things, um, uh, especially when you do a federal project. I mean, every building uh, you're wise to do, and generally you have to do some sort of an in assessment of the building, especially if there's in a downtown area like this to check for any sort of hazardous materials, things like that. We had several instances in the uptown where we had to deal with that. So pretty much every property the town acquired, we went through this fairly extensive process to check and, and double check whether there were any of these types of hazards out there before, and, and remediate them before we built on, on, on that site. The other thing uh, the mayor talked about, for any federal project, uh, it's called the National Environmental Policy Act, and I forget which year, back in the 60s, the feds, the Congress passed this act where any uh, project getting federal money, you have to go through all these things uh, related to the, we call it the NEPA. Uh, and that, that's the, any uh, highway project, any, any project using federal dollars. So that's one of the main things we did on this project. We, we got this project approved through both the Federal Highway Administration as well as the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, they signed off on our environmental documents after we did an extensive study. Um, and that was strategic too because we didn't know how the money was going to be passed down to us, which agency would be in control. So we actually did two separate documents, an environmental, both were environmental assessments that you hear about uh, for this project and we're ready to spend that money. So 
this document is not just purely, uh, it, it deals with cultural aspects and other aspects of a project, not, not purely hazardous materials, things like that, but it's a fairly comprehensive document. I got dirty looks from the panelists last week when I asked this question, so it's only fair that I throw it to you first. I'd like to hear either over the 22 years as a whole or at one specific time within the 22 years, what was the biggest challenge that you faced? And as somebody the most experienced at answering questions from out of left field, I'm going to start with the mayor. Sure. The biggest challenge? Uh, the biggest challenge was um, when I became mayor. Most people in the community are going, that guy? That guy's going to be the mayor? Um, we had just, uh, right after uh, I had become mayor, or right before I had become mayor, um, there was a community referendum um, to stop a, a hotel project that was part of the uptown. And um, it was a gut-wrenching process that we went through in the community. There was lots of uh, pushback on it. People didn't understand what we were trying to do. I th it was a, one of the biggest learning lessons any of us got out of doing this uptown redevelopment was don't get too far out in front of the public on your projects. Uh, that was a real learning experience for us. But um, there, were, there were a number of uh, previous council members who thought it was a terrible idea of what we were doing. Um, they mounted uh, this referendum, and um, I think it was 61% uh, was the number uh, uh, people in the community said, don't do this. And it really put us back on our heels a little bit, and, and that's when we came up with the notion that, you know, we, we got too far out in front of the public and, and didn't give them time to digest what we were doing. Um, we lost a council member in an election over the uptown, and uh, another council member had uh, gotten a job offer, who, uh, Craig Ward, who was very supportive of the uptown development, a very conservative man, but a very supportive of the uptown development. Uh, he took a job in another community and left, and we had two previous council members get elected to uh, the town council. Um, and they were, uh, one especially, was instrumental in, in pushing this effort to stop this madness. Don't, don't do any of these projects down there. So I think I could talk for an hour about that. I won't. But that was, uh, that was the tough okay. one. And, you know, uh, I think within a month, um, Kent Carricker resigned and, and I, I became mayor. And I think that had people scratching their heads a little bit. <laughs> Alan, challenge, your challenge? In the, uh, in the fall of 2003, uh, Unit 5 was in its third year of um, meeting its expenditures by spending down uh, an accumulated reserve. And it was apparent that um, by the end of that school year, uh, that would no longer be possible. Uh, there, there would be no longer uh, any significant reserves to apply to the next school year. I was asked to be a co-chair of a task force of, of Unit 5 citizens that studied that issue and made recommendations to, uh, as to how that could be resolved. Essentially, expenditures had to be reduced uh, by about $6 million for the next school year. On the evening of our last meeting, I was told by one of our board members that our superintendent, who had uh, been on the job about 15, about 16 months at that time, had resigned. I thanked her for the information, and we went on with our meeting, put our report together, and uh, and then about three weeks later, at the uh, December meeting of the board of education, I presented that report. Um, with our recommendations for about six million dollars in reductions of expenditures and 15 minutes later i was appointed interim superintendent <laughs> with the task of implementing that report um, and all of that had to be done by about the end of january so it was a little bit of a scramble as i took on some new responsibilities 
and we were able to accomplish our goal. Uh, it was not easy. Uh, it involved, among other things, the uh, uh, reduction of staff uh, in the school business. 80% of our expenditures are involving staff, so that, that was a painful part of it. We um, closed Eugene Field Elementary School, which caused a significant amount of concern, um, rightfully so. Uh, but we, we did accomplish our goal and created a budget uh, the next year and actually for the next, uh, uh, the next number of years at least that I was involved, we had a balanced budget in our educational fund. But uh, that was a huge, a huge challenge and yeah. one that we were able to meet. Wayne, I know your job's easy, so I'll skip you. No, I'm, what, 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 you can, I'm just kidding. Wayne, you've got to have. Ch yeah, there's a bunch of challenges, of course, and, and think about the Uptown Project uh, challenges there. Uh, every day was a challenge in some way, but uh, the, the thing I tell people is I, I wasn't particularly challenged by ripping up people's streets and, and putting them <laughs> back together because I was familiar with that. But the mayor brings up the, the period, we call it the first hotel project period. That was really the most stressful and challenging period, I think, for us because, you know, a lot of policy decisions by the council, but staff had to react to various scenarios all the time, financial, you know, scenarios and, and other things. And I think that, that one period is, is probably the most challenging period in the uptown. Okay, Dottie. Lean, lean forward to the mic and tell us, did you have a... Well, I, I, you know, they're not huge like these people, but um, I think trying to rehab the, the building that the deli's in turned out to be a whole lot more complicated <laughs> and costly and everything than we thought it would be. But uh, somehow we got through it. We probably made some mistakes, but we corrected most of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're, still, we're still making I changes. But it was, it was an old building that had been kind of misused for quite a while, and so there, was, there were some real challenges in there. Sure. Anybody else out there? Yeah, this, this gentleman here hasn't asked a question yet, so we'll go to him. <clears throat> uh, for the business owners, what are um, the May, what are some of the new issues that you face today that make staying in bus business really difficult, or are there any difficulties? Oh, there's no difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, I think probably the internet is one of the worst ones, uh, or most biggest ones, and that keeps growing as the younger people getting, you know, they use it more than the older people. And, uh, um, of course, just the big chain stores and so on, but I think it's more the internet than anything. That uh, it used to be when I was first in business that some nice new exciting thing would come along and they'd tell us, the salespeople would say, well, they, this is really taking on at Bloomingdale's in New York, you gotta do it. And we said, we've got time, people here won't even know about it for two oh. years, you know, because <laughs> if you put something in too soon, it failed. It had, you had to wait till the proper movement in, in society. And uh, now things are like that, and uh, everyone jumps on them. So it's pretty hard to stay ahead of the game, and uh, that, that's about it. I would agree. And as a small business person, you know, I've said this uh, a lot in, in meetings of, of the business community and small businesses when we were doing marketing studies, retail marketing studies in the uptown. As a small business owner, you've got to be constantly changing yeah. your business, constantly. Um, you, you, you can't relax your product. You know, if, if my store looked exactly like it did 20 years ago, I'd be doing my going out of business sale yeah. because uh, what people want change, uh, what works then doesn't work now. But I'll definitely echo um, um, what Dottie says about, about the internet. And uh, in our business, um, in the shoe business, uh, we have, a, we have a, 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 a technique called fit lifting. And that's where a person will come into the store with a particular problem in their running. Uh, they have a foot problem, a knee problem, something like that. And um, our, our people will, will 
analyze their gait, look at how they're running, and suggest shoes based on that. And then the fit lifter will take all that information and go to the internet and make that purchase. Um, we, uh, we received on a, a, a pretty snarky email last week from a customer, uh, we think a customer, we're not sure, um, who said, uh, I really love your business because I can come in and get good advice and get the shoes I, I need off the internet. Thank you for being there, which I thought was pretty audacious. Um, but it's, a, it's an issue. Uh, it really is an issue. The federal government is looking to help with that issue to le le level the playing field, if you will. Uh, there's uh, legislation that tries to get through Congresses, if anything gets through Congress these days, uh, which would uh, collect sales taxes uh, from internet businesses, larger ones, not the little mom and pops, but the uh, larger ones, and, and distribute that money back to the community. Because those sales tax dollars are, you know, it, it, what pays for the infrastructure in your community. Buy locally unless you can't find it locally, please. Yes, sir. Uh, my question would be have to do with the Uptown 2.0 program. Mm -hmm. um, what's the process and the decision steps in front of it? What kind of feedback have you been getting about enlarging the footprint south over under the railroad, infill buildings on the north side? The, the planning process is still underway. Uh, we've, we received a final draft um, of the project and it'll come to council probably uh, the second meeting in, first or second meeting in November for approval. Um, frankly, um, the expansion to the south has been pretty well received. I mean, um, people that came to the public meetings and talked about it liked the ideas. Um, how how that would develop specifically is is yet to uh, be determined. Uh, this is just a, a plan, a guiding document. It's not the the, the final document. If you look at the uh, master plan for Uptown Normal, the first iteration of that. Um, the hotel is not where it was planned to be. Um, Children's Discovery Museum is not where it was planned to be, and the Transportation Center is not where it was planned to be. Um, these are guiding documents. Um, but in terms of the overall acceptance of the community for, for the Uptown Plan uh, 2.0, it's, it's been well received. Um, the controversy has been probably centered around uh, uh, a proposed underpass and the cost of that underpass. Uh, but most people who came to the public meetings thought that the underpass was the best solution. I'm going to ask one more before we let everybody go um, finish their weekend. And Alan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to impose upon you to put on a different hat. Uh, and this is a, a question that's coming completely off the board, but I know that you can handle it. One thing over the past two weeks that we haven't talked about, and I'd like you to just talk about for a little bit, is social services over the past 22 years, over this period of time. How they changed, how the challenges involved, just that the, the entire, entire kind of social service arena. Uh, schools have been greatly impacted by uh, changes in our society, uh, changes in families, um, <clears throat> changes in uh, level of, um, of uh, people that are subjected to poverty, all of those things. And, and all of those factors have, have uh, translated into an increased need for services either that we provide within the schools or that our communities provide, certainly. Our largest, thinking in terms of the time period that we're discussing today, our largest growth in a department has been special education by far. Uh, the, the law has demanded that we provide more and more services for students. And when we can't, we are trying to work cooperatively with uh, communities and agencies to provide what our students need or to access services that our students need uh, so that they can be as successful as possible uh, in our school environment and in the community. 
So it's, a, it's an increasing need. It's, a, it's one that's difficult to meet uh, both within our schools and within the community. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that our, our sales tax increase is uh, at least in part targeted toward uh, mental health uh, issues and services. Uh, we can't be successful as a society unless we help the people that are most in need uh, be as successful as they can be. So it, it behooves us to, uh, to work hard uh, toward that end. I love that as a point to end on. So uh, we thank you all so much for, for coming. If you think you forgot something, look at it on YouTube. Uh, you go through the wonderful Town of Normal uh, website and uh, get connected to all of that. And um, unless there's anything else, that's going to do it for us. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, you've been photo time.